Awesome. All right, 4.30 is upon us, or if you're in the Pacific time, it's 1.30. Uh, my name is Gina, I'll be moderating this session, and we have a ooh, we have a whole cornucopia of uh, presenters here today. So welcome Elizabeth, Angela, Katie, and Jennifer. Um, they're gonna be presenting open source software and beyond. I'd like to thank our sponsors, our champion sponsors, Emerald Data, Equinox, and Mobius. Uh, Equinox being the platform sponsor and Emerald Data being the captioning sponsor. I have the uh, captioning link somewhere in chat, but I'll post it again throughout the presentations. Um, I think that's pretty much it. So whenever you'd like to take it away. Oh, and if you have questions uh, that you'd like to uh, post in chat, I can make sure that everybody could get those too. Uh, if they are not taking a look at chat. But in any case, uh, here you go. Thank you, Gina. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, this conversation actually came out of a um, chat, open S chat that uh, Equinox had hosted. So thank you guys for, for doing that community service. Uh, I always enjoy it. And uh, so one of the conversations we were having was uh, you know, what What besides Evergreen is open source in our lives? And uh, I will let everybody um, introduce themselves, uh, but that I just kind of wanted to give everyone the context for, for how that got started. Uh, I am Katie Greenleaf Martin, and I am the executive director of the Pennsylvania Integrated Library System, which we call the Spark Consortium. And I have with me here, Elizabeth, if you want to introduce yourself, if you're back. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Elizabeth Davis. I'm the support and project management specialist for Pales slash Spark. And our friends from Equinox, Angela. Hi, everyone. I'm Angela Kilsdunk. I'm the product and education manager at Equinox. And Jennifer. And I am Jennifer Weston, product and education specialist here at Equinox. So uh, the first thing uh, that I wanted to start out with today was just uh, a little bit about free and open source software. Uh, and I was uh, thrilled that Vitika this morning mentioned the uh, free is in freedom, not free is in beer. Um, I, I prefer uh, uh, free is in kittens because you still have to take care of all the care and feeding. Um, and uh, so it, you know, uh, open source software uh, is software that we have the freedom to use, to copy, to fuss with. Um, and uh, oh, yes, and the, and like having a kitten, it has many benefits. Thank you, Jason. That's it. I'd, I don't know why I didn't think about that part of the metaphor, but it's perfect. Um, and so, you know, you can can make your own changes and develop your own branches and do what you want with. This is different, although overlapping, um, from the concept of freeware or free software. Uh, you can download and run the Spotify client for free, and you can use most of its content on an ad-supported basis. Uh, but it has a subscription price and you, uh, while it is based on a number of open source components, you cannot take that software and modify it and do what you want with it. So there is uh, a big difference if uh, a substantial overlap in the worlds of free and open source software. So I stuck a bunch of um, links in here and, and they're in the slides, uh, but I think that it's interesting to get a little bit more into uh, the world of what it means to have open source code and uh, what that looks like, not only in the sense of software, uh, but also in other realms of our lives, as we're gonna hear about um, in a number of ways later in the presentation. Uh, and you will hear uh, sometimes the, the word uh, Libra, I'm talking about uh, LibreOffice in a minute, uh, as, as being a different twist on the, on the free, because uh, that, that linguistic definition is a little bit different in Romance languages than it is in English. So 
uh, I just wanted to kind of start with that introduction to the concepts that we're going to be talking about today. Everything that we're talking about today is at least freeware. Most of the things that we are talking about today are also available open source. Some, most of the things that we're going to talk about today are software. Some of them are not. So some of that, some of them take that concept to other places in addition to the software realm. So the first thing that I wanted to discuss uh, is a project uh, by the Document Foundation. And uh, those of us who've been using uh, Linux at home for a while or have uh, familiarity with a number of library products that use Linux thin clients to provide public computer service are familiar with uh, LibreOffice, which is the successor of OpenOffice. And this is a document management suite, not unlike another document management suite that you may have heard of that uh, has, you know, a text and writing component, a spreadsheet component, a presentation component, uh, and a database component. So there, and there are um, a number of both free and, and paid suites that offer those. Uh, but this is one that is completely open source. And so you can use it as is, or if you want, you can take it and fuss with it. I have to say that while I've been using OpenOffice slash LibreOffice for many years uh, in my personal life, I have never actually tried to uh, get under the hood. So uh, that, that may be an interesting project for me at, at some point. Um, but the Document Foundation, the group that maintains this, is you know really committed to this concept of both free and open source software and having a fully functional enterprise style office suite that people around the world can use um and yeah i would agree with gina i, I find it uh very useful and very user friendly um it does give me trouble uh mail merging uh envelopes for my annual christmas cards but i have to say that Every platform that I have ever used to mail merge envelopes has given me trouble. So I don't think that's unique uh, to uh, to open source software. Oh, that's so exciting! Jason Stephenson contributed a patch to the database component. Um, so that's that's exciting that we have a a, a LibreOffice code committer with us today. Uh, and so that's that's kind of a basic one. It's a, a pretty drop in um, replacement for some things that we that we often pay for. Another tool that we use quite a bit around the offices here at Pales, um, and I, I want to give my fellow presenters plenty of time to talk. But if we have time later, uh, then I can can demo kind of some of the things that we do with this. But those of you who attended um, Rogan's pre-conference yesterday on SQL or SQL uh, will note that he was using a uh, command line browser to interact with the database. Uh, we don't use Bash or another command line data uh, platform here at Pales. We use a client that has a GUI to run uh, SQL queries on our instance of Evergreen. We have read-only access, and we still tend to run things first on the uh, test database before we run them on production, just to make sure that we're not that we're going to get the expected result. Um, but this is a product that is used in a lot of uh, both enterprise and non-enterprise applications, and um, it's you know something that we we use on a on a daily basis to be able to get information out of our out of our database and we appreciate uh having an open source client so and if I, we have time later that i can demo that but for the moment i will throw to angela to talk about subject plus well over to me thanks katie so I'm going to talk a bit about Subjects Plus today, and I'm excited to do that. Um, for full disclosure, as I mentioned, I work at Equinox, and Equinox does provide hosting support training, et cetera, for Subjects Plus, just like we do for Evergreen. But I'm excited to talk to you about Subjects Plus today 
Um, it is a browser based open source. Oh, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, so, Subjects Plus is a browser based open source content management system. Um, it is specifically designed and developed for libraries. So, among other features, you can use Subjects Plus to create well designed resource and topic guides. A to Z database list, frequently asked questions, page, video management, all sorts of things. Um, and it can generally be used to create and really easily maintain a professional library website with little or no knowledge of web design or coding. Um, so just like we saw with um, LibreOffice, there is a well-known proprietary counterpart um, that provides similar functionality, libguides. So I'm always glad to have the opportunity to kind of highlight those open source options that exist for you know, common, common tools that are being used in libraries and beyond that can provide similar functionality. Um, On to the next slide, there we go. Um, so a little bit about Subjects Plus. Um, it was originally developed at the Joiner Library at East Carolina University in the early 2000s. Um, and the original developer, Andrew Darby, I think had a little bit of fun and called it Pirate Source. So here you can see my pirate hippo. Um, at the Evergreen Conference last year, I was part of a um, hold presentation. The hippo was our mascot, so I just wanted to sneak him in here, pirate hippo. Um, so after that, with permission, the, the software was expanded and released as open source software at Ithaca College Library. And that development continues now, kind of centered at the University of Miami, and there are contributors from, from really all over the world. So over the years, just like we see with Evergreen, it's, it's been a community effort. Um, you can see Subjects Plus does have academic roots, but I want to show you today it's, it's a really flexible system and it can be used by libraries of all types and sizes to create professional resource guides and, and websites for use of your libraries. Um, so let's just take a look at a few examples of kind of what you can do with Subjects Plus. Um, one of the things that you can create are resource and topic guides. This lovely guide was created by my colleague Felicia Boudre. So the look and feel of the guides is controlled by a CSS theme. You can create custom themes that match your library website and branding. And one nice thing is you can also create multiple themes that your library might want to use for different pages. So you can really select which theme you want to apply to a particular guide, have some variation. Um, so you can produce a really nice looking web page. Um, Subjects Plus itself provides users and users with a really easy framework to edit and build these guides and web pages. On the next slide, if we take a look at the guide here, this just shows us what Subjects Plus looks like kind of as the guide editor. So this is what we work with behind the scenes. This guide is using kind of the three column layout you can see here. There are other layouts you can choose from. And from here, there's a variety of different content boxes that you can just add in to edit and maintain your contact content. Excuse me. So you can have different content boxes for text, link lists, videos, images. There's also in the lower right hand corner, you can see there's a tool to um, connect to your ILS catalog to search directly from your research guide. So that's nice as well. Going on to the next slide, kind of working with <clears throat> that layout, there's a flyout menu where you can just kind of drag and drop all the different kind of content boxes you might want into any area of that layout to add in your content. Um, Subjects Plus has a responsive design. So as you build this and users take a look at it, it's gonna match the device that is being viewed on. Just to show kind of a few examples of how you can edit content in Subjects Plus and what that looks like, how easy it is to use. Um, this is an example using that same guide of an editable box, kind of see the layout here. And then within the next slide, you can see the actual interface for editing it. And it's a pretty typical WYSIWYG editor. Um, there's also an option to view the source, so you can edit the HTML directly as well, which is really handy. 
And there's just one more example to show you a little bit more. Um, the box, the content box below that is a link list. And this is generated by adding previously created records that represent all the different resources your libraries might have access to. Um, adding them to this list on the specific guide. These are the same records that could form the A to Z resource list or database list, and they can be repurposed here in your guides as well. So the next slide is just a look behind the scenes there. If we edit that box, this is what you can see. So you can see that Subjects Plus makes it really easy to edit your website. Um, here you can search those records and add them to this content box. You can select how you'd want them to display an option, excuse me, an icon, a note, a description. Um, there's a lot of options there. And that information comes from those underlying records. So I mentioned the A to Z list, and this is an example just of what that looks like on the end user side. So again, all the, the branding is configurable, but another example of what our end users can see. And the underlying staff interface on the next slide there is where we can configure all of those records that make up that list and, and creates those underlying records that can be used on other guides. And on the next slide, there's just a quick look at that interface. So this is where we would create that record for a specific database or other resource, put in all of the descriptive elements um, and other metadata. So there are a lot of options here that make that information easy to edit and really include the information you might want to make available to your end users. So that is just a really quick look at some of the features that Subjects Plus can provide. There's, there's so much more. Um, I included a link, or excuse me, I included a, an image there of uh, the built-in link checker, which I think is really cool. Makes it really easy to check all the links that you might have in your guides and web pages. So um, there's a lot of handy features here in the system. Um, Subjects Plus is you know, just a great way to make resources and information available for both you know, library patrons and users and library staff. And of course, as open source software, on the next slide there, there's a community of users and developers. So there are links here to the Subjects Plus community, the website, the wiki, forum, and the source code on GitHub. So all that good information about that open source community is there as well. Okay, um, thank you. I think I'm handing things over to Elizabeth. Yep, thanks. So I'm going to talk about OpenRefine. Um, so OpenRefine is a desktop application that you can use to handle large data cleanup projects and batch edits. So if you've ever tried to you know, export something from Evergreen and you have this great list of maybe addresses or bib records and you're finding that you, know, you have a lot of typos or misspellings or your zip codes are oddly structured or you know, if you find that a lot of your email addresses don't have, you know, at symbols or domains uh, and you need to use it in another service, OpenRefine is a great tool to kind of help you clean up um, all of that fun, you know, typos. Um, it's written in Java and it'll run in your web browser. And the nice thing about OpenRefine is that all of your data is saved locally. So you don't, um, you don't have a ton of concerns about, um, you know, having it mysteriously appear somewhere else. Uh, you can also use it to add, um, add like use web services for functioning. Um, one, one that I like to use is the geocoding. You can pull addresses um, and then use maybe a Google API to pull all the mapping for the longitude and latitude. Um, there are probably other services that could do this for you, but if you want to do it yourself and map uh, addresses, um, you can do that with OpenRefine. You can also use uh, the reconciliation process to link to data in existing data sets. And um, a lot of examples I've seen of this is cleaning up your subject headings or you know, fixing or adjusting uh, variations in names, um, things like that. I've seen a lot of examples. 
and um, it comes with a lot of built-in tools. But one of the fun things is that you can use the general refined expression language or JSON or I'm going to say closure. So if I'm not mispronouncing that, please let me know. Um, you can use those languages to build uh, custom facets and uh, editing. So, you know, you're not limited to just the tool set that it's built with. So um, I have some screenshots of things that I've used OpenRefine for. Um, this is kind of how it loads. Uh, it's pretty simple looking, uh, but it's pretty powerful. On the left, you see you have uh, facets and filters and then the undo and redo options. And then all of your uh, functions are in those little carrots um, under, uh, I guess they'd be drop downs. Uh, so any of your options will be available there. Um, this is a data set from um, the Concerto data set that I've edited to make it a little bit easier and made all of those lovely ads and additions that uh, you've probably experienced if you've ever imported your um, data in over from an another ILS or that had free text. So um, something that we've experienced a lot in libraries is, uh, you know, odd abbreviations for things like streets or avenues or townships, um, you know, adding random text that, you know, is not an email address, but they put in anyway. So uh, if you I go to the next slide, Katie. Uh, yep, yep, so thank you. Uh, you see they have some built-in functions uh, right off the bat. You can trim and uh, white space on the beginning or the end. You can collapse consecutive white space. You can change everything for upper to lower, all of that fun stuff. Um, it really kind of helps batch edit those all. And you know, my example only has 230 rows, but if you have thousands of rows, um, you know, if you've used other products, you know that you kind of sometimes hit a limit or you know you just crash the software, which I've done several times. So um, it's not fun, and then you lose all of your edits. So uh, <laughs> Open Refine kind of helps you along with that. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So in this one, um, one of the fun features is the facets. I love facets. Um, I'll probably wax poetically about them. But you can see um, if you facet, um, say, the city column, you can see all of the variations on spellings. And using the edit feature, you can just batch edit those four or five or 10 or you know, later examples, hundreds of typos so you can standardize your um, information. Again, this works great with um, mailing lists. And you can, you know, see all the fun uh, variations on spellings that your your staff are using for things. Uh, it works great with zip codes, but my absolute favorite is the email address. So if you go to the next slide, is you can build your own custom uh, text filter, and in this one, it's going to look at your address, email addresses, and look for and make sure it has all the components that a standard email address should have being A, the username, the ad symbol, the domain. And using um, the text filter, you can filter out all the ones that are missing those components. And so if you're maybe using another service for your email uh, newsletters, this will strip out all of those that don't have the correct formatting, and then you don't get all of those lovely bounce backs and error messages when you're loading them. So, you know, not not revolutionary, it's not going to change the world, but it's going to save you a couple of headaches uh, along the way. Okay, so the next slide, please. So this is an example of some bibs that I pulled from um, our database. And as you can see, our, our rows have significantly uh, increased. So now we have about 289,000 rows of bib data. And so some of the edits that we've made or used in the past um, can you go to the next slide, Katie? Um, the nice thing about OpenRefine is you can use multiple facets. So, you know, you can facet on maybe the type um, and then just look at those different item types. But you can also try and use the facets, say, on the publication year. 
And when you load it, you see, okay, it looks okay. You look in your first thousand rows, all the numbers look pretty okay. But when you go to facet, you're finding like, wow, I have over 200,000 facets and it's just too much, I can't handle it. So obviously there's something wonky going on. So if you go to the next slide, you can use a great feature uh, called cluster and edit. And what it'll do is based on um, the method and the keying function, it'll go through all of your uh, rows and see what ones are common. So you can see that there are over 350 um, rows that have some der derivative of 2000. So it, it's C2000, C.2000, C2000 dash, and it's realizing that those are probably the same number, they're probably the same thing, and you're gonna wanna merge them and you can edit them. So if you want to standardize your, um, you know, your publication year, you can select the, the that checkbox in the middle, edit to just 2000, and then what it'll do is it'll batch change all 353 um, rows in, in one click. And you can go through and edit all of those uh, merge suggestions um, and edit them so that you have a standard format. So. I use that a lot and I like it. <laughs> if you could go to the next slide. The next one that I really like is the uh, the ability to split multi-valued cells. So I'm sorry the screenshot's not super clear, but on the on the last um, row, there's just a lot of publisher information and you can see there's like the the city and then the name of the publisher and then some extra information. So what you can do is you can separate those so you can standardize that information as well. So you can um, fix any typos or uh, formatting issues that you're having. So you can use the split multiple uh, multi cells by your, you know, your delimiter. And Katie, can you go to the next? And you can see what happens in the background. It breaks everything down into individual rows. And then you can use your cluster and edit function uh, and change over 8,000 rows uh, to format New York City to be the, the, the standard that you want to use. Um, I know if I did this in any other software, I probably would have crashed it by now and missed a ton because you know find and edit will only do so much. It's not going to be in intuitive enough to say, oh, New York, comma, NY is the same as New York, you know, NY, you know, bracket, you know, the software is helpful in that fashion. Um, can you go to the next slide, Katie? And then some other things, if you are using, um, custom facets a lot, you can save them and favorite them. So if you know, you're know you doing a lot of the repeats uh, functions in your data cleanup all the time, you can save those functions and then just go in and rerun them. Um, it makes things a lot easier and you don't have to remember, oh, what was that one that I always do? It kind of gives you the, the favorites and it will preview. I didn't do a screenshot, but you can do previews to make sure that your uh, syntax is correct and it's going to perform the way you want it to. Um, so once you've standardized all of your info, you can then rejoin all of those rows that you broke apart to fix. That's really cool. Um, so that if you have, you know, if you want to have a standard one row for everything, you can merge them back together, which is really cool. Um, I think I have one more slide, Katie. So like I said, uh, these are just some examples of things you can do with OpenRefine. There are a ton of um, tutorials online. You may see it re uh, referred to as Google Refine. It was um, bought in the early 2000s by Google and then became an open source project. So I highly encourage you to check out their website, OpenRefine, and then you can contribute uh, to the GitHub. And then there are Google Groups. Um, but one thing I do want to promote is the Library Carpentry website. They are a, a great organization or group of volunteers that are working to educate library and information uh, 
you know, people who work in information and data on, you know, data cleanup projects. And they have a ton of tutorials for Open Refine, but they also have tutorials on SQL, R, and Python, as well as other like data cleanup uh, workshops. So if this is something you're interested in, um, I really encourage you to check out that uh, group as well. So that's all I have for now. Uh, and I think Jennifer's next. Okay, that's me. Thank you, Elizabeth. I've only played with Open Refine just a little, but I've barely scratched the surface. I really want to find more time to, to use it because I feel like it will save me a lot of time, right? Okay, moving on. My piece today is I'm going to talk about open rules for cataloging or ORC and I'll just use the abbreviation as we continue. It's a relatively new library community initiative. It's operating as an open collaboration to form a new open cataloging content standard. So Katie promised we'd be looking at things beyond software and this is certainly beyond software. Uh, in brief, open rules for cataloging is an initiative to create a freely available collaborative cataloging code created by catalogers for catalogers. Project was formed and initiated by Amber Billy of Bard College in 2019 as Open Cataloging Rules, but more on that later. Much of the content for the slides I'm sharing today comes from a presentation Amber delivered at the 2021 Netzel Online Conference, that's the New England Technical Services Librarians, um, which is where I was first introduced to the project. So today I'm just going to briefly introduce the project to suggest why an initiative like Open Rules for Cataloging is important and necessary. I'll summarize the project's vision, scope, and principles, share a little bit about the project's history and future plans for development, and then just end with providing information about opportunities to participate or, or to learn more. Next slide. So are we really talking about another cataloging content standard? Yes. Yes, we are. Many of us have probably seen and shared this cartoon from XKCD illustrating how standards proliferate and we can relate. And I love that the keynote speaker used this today. So when she mentioned it, I thought, oh, that's already in our presentation. So check out XKCD if you haven't already. But back to this, we do indeed find ourselves in a library world with many, many, many competing standards. Open rules for cataloging is not an attempt to develop a new universal standard, but it does seek to provide a new alternative to existing ones. Next slide. So why? Why is ORC necessary? Why do I think it's important? And I should have said this from the beginning, this is a project I'm involved in, not with my Equinox hat, but with my just open access, open standard uh, community world hat. So this is something I, I do as a volunteer outside of my regular Equinox duties. Um, so when I talk about why is ORC and, and we, it's the volunteer community that I'm talking about. So RSC, ORC began with the conclusion, which is shared by catalogers in many different types of libraries serving many different types of communities that the implementation of an emerging RDA content model was challenging at best due to cost in terms of time and money and in the quagmire of interpreting and applying RDA conceptual guidelines. So the natural next question so many of us have asked is, what would an alternative look like? And that is the genesis of open rules for cataloging, which is being formed as a freely available, hence open alternative to RDA that will reduce needless expense, promote inclusion and facilitate data interoperability. Next slide. So a quick note about how open rules for cataloging would reduce unnecessary expense. There's already a healthy open access movement in libraries, which is what we're celebrating here today. And there is a strong historic precedent. Several examples are listed here. I'm not going to read them all, but including ISBD, which is still freely available online. And the most recent example is the inspirational move by DCRM or the descriptive cataloging of rare materials to produce their own RDA edition and make it open access. So you can now go online and see their open access RDA edition of the rules for descriptive cataloging of rare materials. And I applaud them for that effort. We're also seeing uh, global library momentum and moving away from closed standards and seeking more interoperable paths. And when we stop to look at the numbers representing the actual cost of acquiring full access to RDA, the results are astounding. When AACR, or Anglo-American Cataloging Rules that we love so much, was first released in 1967, the cost to purchase a print copy of the rules was $9.30, which would be approximately $77.56 today. Meanwhile, the average annual price for a single subscription for the RDA toolkit as of January 1st of this year is $197, and it's going up each year. 
That is for one single subscription requiring annual renewal. So according to the numbers published on the ALA website, and I checked those yesterday, there are currently 116,867 libraries in the United States, which means the annual cost for one subscription for each library in the country, just one, comes to $23,022,799 per year. So next slide. Hence, open rules for cataloging would promote inclusion and encourage participation by eliminating cost requirements that exclude so many libraries, and also by building an initiative based on transparency and on an open collaborative environment to enable professional cooperation outside of the large institutional power structures that have been historically dominant in content development and representation. Next slide. So with any new content standard, interoperability is absolutely a requirement. As library catalogs are integrating or connecting with an increasing number of sources for library data, and we know um, that ourselves from just seeing how, how many different sources of data that we have, and it all needs to play nicely together. Uh, this, this image there is really taken from an academic library that, that Amber used in her original presentation, but we could just switch it out for some of the other data sources that public libraries use, and the, the, the meaning is the same. Um, Open rules for cataloging suggest that bibliographic data doesn't need to be so darn complicated, and if it were streamlined and focused, the ease of use with different data services would increase substantially. Next slide. So ORC, ORC has adopted the vision statement you see here with an emphasis on free and open guidelines with practical examples, and I love this part, with easily understood models created by catalogers to empower catalogers. The scope of the project has been very clearly identified to serve the vision of the initiative. Here again, you can see the commitment to open access, inclusivity, interoperability. In addition, there's a clear goal to provide comprehensive and sensible guidelines and models provided by the community for the community. Initially, the models will be mark based as this is still the most widely adopted encoding standard. However, the cataloging rules will not be tied to a particular coding format. Next slide. And I think on the next one is where I talk about next slide. OK, there we go. For the project's own principles, uh, ORC generally adheres to, to IFLA or the International Federation of Library Association and Institutions. I'll just use IFLA, to the IFLA Statement of International Cataloging Principles, which is another open access resource. ORC has documented each of these principles and applied special emphasis on key principles that are important to ORC and slight modifications for simplification of adoption. I'm not going to read them all. You can read IFLA Statement there. And if you want to see all of the, um, the slight modifications that have been made for ORC, just let me know. I'll point you in the right direction. But I did want to just highlight a couple of things here. Specifically, I wanted to look at talk about the convenience of the user. The word user embraces anyone who searches the catalog and uses the bibliographic and or authority data. So cataloging decisions should always be made with the user in mind. Uh, representation, I just wanted to mention because in this case, representation means very, something very specific and, and um, not in, a, in a, any kind of diversity sort of, of situation. Instead, it's talking about how the resource is represented. So the cataloging sense of the word representation. And it does include the utilization of controlled vocabularies, whether those are national standards or local standards. It, it, um, representation does talk about how you represent the book. I just wanted to make sure, or, or the format, or the material there. I just wanted to briefly mention that one. And then a couple of others here, sufficiency and necessity. This is key to ORC. It suggests that open cataloging rules, and I think we lost the slides there. But I'll keep talking. Suggest that open Sorry, catalog Jennifer. It's coming. It's coming back. I try. I went ahead too far and tried to go back in it. That's fine. I'll keep talking. Yep. Okay. So um, I was talking about sufficiency and necessity, which uh, ORC strongly believes that open cataloging rules need to contain a set of data elements that are only those that are absolutely needed to facilitate access for all types of users, and to fulfill the objectives and functions of the catalog, and to sufficiently describe or identify entities, which is also tied to, and we're on slide 41, Katie, which is also tied to economy, where preference should be given to cataloging in a way that best furthers overall expediency and practicality, which if we put in another way, just means you, we, we look for, for a, method for, a method for cataloging, which 
which you uh, which create the least cost and the simplest approach. So what costs the least and what is the simplest to do and still be sufficient and necessary. And I'm on slide 42 now. I've only got just a few more. Do you, would be best to share I, mine? Or are you good? I may just not try to take it to the, the slideshow. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Because it appears to not like that. Okay, yep, we're on the same slide now, thank you. Uh, and before you, people start to worry if I'm gonna talk about all these different elements in cataloging, because I've been known to do such things, I'm not doing that today, because this is not a cataloging presentation, but I did wanna share the draft outline of the elements that the Open Resource Cataloging Project has adopted to date. This is just the seven content categories with the individual elements associated. You know, I just mentioned that they looked at what is sufficient and necessary, and, and this is um, the list that we've come up with. Um, the initial data element definitions are focusing on non-rare monographic resources. Additional formats will, of course, be added, but this is just the starting point. And we can go to the next slide. And on the next slide that says history there, yep, I'm just going to wrap up uh, with a couple of slides to talk about the timeline of how the project got started, how it's going, and where it is going. The project was formed, in, as I've already said, initiated by Amber Billy of Bard College in 2019 as Open Cataloging Rules. Under Amber's leadership from August of that year until March 2020, members of the core committee, of which I am part of, um, we are a small group of volunteers willing to take on the work of the project, formulated the vision, scope, principles, and element set. Due to the pandemic, no work was really done on the project at all until it was revived by Denise Sufi at the University of North Carolina in December of 2020. Uh, Faye Leibowitz is a retired librarian, previously from the University of Pittsburgh. She also volunteered to co-lead the project with Denise to revive it in late 2020. In 2021, the core committee determined which sources it would use to develop the cataloging rules and began developing a workflow. Public, a publication platform was also decided on. Committee members began introducing the project at conferences, including Netzel, which is where I first encountered it. Um, they presented again in 2021 and also presented to SILIP, which is the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals in the UK. It's essentially the UK Library and Information Association. And Denise was invited personally to come speak uh, to, the, to the UK Association last year. We were excited to start spreading the word outside of this country and start getting an international response. And next slide. So current activity in March of this year, the project began a rebranding effort. This is what I said uh, earlier. We talk a little bit more about why the name changed, but we changed it because open rules for cataloging is what we are now. Previously, we were OCR, which is an acronym for optical character recognition. And there was some thought in the library community that, that might just be a little too confusing. So instead of OCR, we became ORC, a small thing, but it was important. So we're going through the process now of, of rebranding both the website and, and then starting a new GitHub project. But, so if you've seen it one, you know, uh, referred to as open cataloging rules or open rules for cataloging, it's the same project. Uh, the core committee, uh, core committee now meets routinely, bi-weekly, and operates with two subcommittees. The rules subcommittee is working on the development of the rules for each of those elements that you saw on a previous slide. And the platform subcommittee is working on a GitHub project with a focus on creating style sheets and then testing the eventual rules spreadsheet conversion process so that we can publish it all and have a website where um, people would have access to, to the cataloging rules. Court committee is also spreading the word at conferences like this one. This year already, um, the court committee has presented at the Amigos Library Services Conference and NC Serials. There is a link here on that slide, and of course you'll get the slides, but to a preprint article that was written just after the NC Serials Conference that provides a more detailed update on the project if you're interested. And next slide. And here is a requisite how you can get involved slide. Um, there are a few resources listed here for anyone interested in learning more or getting involved in the open rules cataloging. If you're just curious, you want to look around. Um, those are a couple of links for you to follow up on. I will say there was an update that was shared via email to the group's email list earlier this week. And if you are interested in that, just email me and I'll be glad to share it with you. The current state of the project is such that the website needs to be updated, needs to be rebranded, and we need to, to start publishing this information. But right now, it's all just going through that, that Google Gmail list. Anybody can sign up for the list. So if you're, you're interested in that, I would encourage you to do so. Um, but in, until the website gets rebranded, we're looking at doing that in the next six months, in the next three to six months, getting all of, uh, all of this published. 
Also, um, as far as timelines go, one of the things we're looking at is starting to publish a, a full timeline for the next two to four years of the project with an emphasis of within the next 12 to 18 months having the rules published and and, and, a, and, a, and put out to the community so anybody can, can look at them and start uh, talking about how they can be adopted in libraries. And again, the, the rules are just that list of those basic elements that we can all agree upon are, are really required for, um, for accurately representing the materials without making it a little too complicated. But it's not going to happen overnight. There's a lot of work that's gone in this already um, and a lot more work to be done. So if you're interested, we certainly need volunteers. But again, we're committed to a timeline to get this rolled out, at least the initial phase of it by, by the end of next year. That's kind of it for open rules for cataloging. Uh, our next slide is just a summary. So in summary, the four of us have just hosted a celebration of all things open. These, the benefits of open access, open source, and open standards are clearly too numerous to count. So today we've only just discussed a few of them. We could talk about the open world and I'm sure we could just open up the floor and we could get all kinds of, of suggestions on open tools that you use. But what we'd like to say in summary is just all of the things we've talked about really share the same benefits. Benefits of lower cost, greater accessibility, transparency, customization, and above all, the ability to influence and actively participate in these vibrant communities. With that, I will just say thank you. And our next slide just says questions so we can open it up to the floor. Thank you. One question I did want to ask uh, the audience uh, while we have a, a few moments before the official end of the day today is the same question that I asked Vitika this morning, which was what other um, products and open source projects are ones that you all use? I know Elizabeth mentioned R, which is a great uh, stats product. Um, definitely appreciate that one when I'm, I'm doing some heavy lifting with, with statistics. WordPress. Yep. Uh, is it, that's definitely a good one. And, uh, and so, yeah, those of us who, uh, use, use Linux products, um, either at home or, or at work are, are gonna, gonna be finding alternatives. <laughs> you can have proprietary software on a, on an open source system, but you don't, don't usually, uh, oh, and Gina's presentation earlier, uh, she was talking about draw.io, which is open source uh, wireframing if you are doing design. The GIMP is a great one, uh, an image editing program. I am not familiar with H5P or with Inkscape or with Request Tracker, but those all sound cool. Drupal, another uh, uh, website building program. Archive Space and Omika. Oh, there's too many to read now. This is excellent. Lily Pond, Scribus, Audacity, Inkscape is a, okay. Vector Graphics, that makes sense. Oh, and I know, uh, Elizabeth, you talked a little bit about uh, geolocation. Uh, is that something that you're using any of the, the open mapping tools for? Um, not yet, but I did see some um, in some of the examples that they were using them. So Blender so it is possible. 3D modeling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that is that is available. I I have not I have not done uh, any of the geolocation stuff myself. Uh, Linux distributions, uh, a lot of people use Ubuntu. We use uh, Mint here at, at my house, which is um, very similar. Yes, Ever, Evergreen is open source. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Mike Rylander. We would be remiss if we did not mention uh, Evergreen, Koha, uh, as well as uh, Viewfind and uh, Aspen. Um, there are a number of open source library, library products. Ooh, open source password manager, Bitwarden. I like that. 
Yes, we have uh, similarly been through uh, being being an all Linux household. We have been through from Red Hat to Fedora, from Ubuntu to Mint. I think we were running a different uh, Debian Debian based one for a while. Oh, I don't I don't know. Man Manjaro is not one that I'm familiar with. We had Puppy Linux for a while for a little mm -hmm. uh, miniature machine. Uh, Manjaro was like, I, I only did it because um, they said it was good for gaming and it, okay. it's nice like that. It has like a good driver, like an install process, but uh, it got like annoying with the restarting. So I just went with Ubuntu, but yeah, I heard that Mint is really good because it's a lean uh, operating system. Yeah, we, I mean, we use it at home and it works with our peripherals um, and it's just, you know, I think, I think we're on six or seven years of, of using it and we just, it requires no, no care and feeding. <laughs> so we, we, we like it. So uh, if people do have, I, I could do do this for the for the rest of the time certainly, and talk about everybody's favorite uh, open source projects. This is has been really fun, uh, but I do want to uh, make sure that I know if anyone else has other questions. The the uh, geolocation one uh, was a good one. Um, so if uh, if other people have have questions, then we'd be we'd be happy to throw that out there as well. But it is also the end of the day. So yeah. people may be. Well, ready. thank you uh, very much for at least presenting at open source. I'm always uh, curious to know like what's coming down, uh, you know, the pipeline for what's available. And, um, you know, just also to side with you on LibreOffice, like I, I use it and I'd, I'd say like the current version is so user friendly. Um, and it's uh you know it's something that I think about every now and then in terms of like oh if you, you know you, you could have something like this that you don't have to necessarily pay like a huge licensee thing for if you have like a even if it's like subscription based um it's something I think about sometimes like a lot of like models I feel like are going towards that subscription based uh, pricing where it's like here's this annual price to use like Adobe for example um, and I think that kind of like makes the options like. Well, at least makes makes me like lean more towards open source because uh, personally, I just I hate that subscription model. But I, I don't know about anyone else's opinions about that. Yeah, well, I think that you know Jennifer did the cost breakdown, and uh, you know you, when you when you even even if it looks like a small monthly or annual cost, when you talk about supporting that cost per user for decades. It's, you know, you're, guys, your nice, like, exponential growth curve. I guess it's not exponential growth, but um, it, it really adds up. I'm sorry, did, did anyone mention, uh, like, video editing software that's open source? We had a couple of audio ones. Did we have any video ones? Oh, yeah. I think Oops. someone mentioned GIMP. Does GIMP do videos too, or just still? Oh, sorry, videos. I'm not sure. There's DaVinci. Lightworks is okay. Film. Oh well. Yeah, it seems like OpenShot's a really popular one here. That's I was using robust, Kira, but like they made me pay another or wanted me to pay a subscription for it again so that's why i'm kind of like uh looking for other options sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you elizabeth oh no i was just gonna say open shots pretty robust um if you, if you need to use it i used it recently so. yes elizabeth got tasked with uh scrubbing user data from one of our user group presentations that we accidentally screen shared so she uh she got to learn <laughs> learn a little bit about that 
Uh, question came in here. Any alternatives to Adobe Acrobat? It looks like a, yeah, a few people are answering. Ooh, yeah. Um, so uh, LibreOffice will will do much like it's uh, paid compatriots um, and or um, free as in beer like like Google. Um, we'll will export uh, PDFs. And um, I don't know if you can edit things that are already PDF'd in LibreOffice or not, but you can certainly generate them. Um, na native PDF printing came to LibreOffice much, many, many years before it came to some other, some other places. Um, there are some other ones. I think In Inkscape will do it. Uh, Uh, I mean, the, the PDF itself, I don't believe is an open standard, so it gets a little squirrely. So for staying on schedule, we have about five minutes. Um, though I, you know, I don't want to break up a good discussion about open source. Um, yeah, I just wanted to remind people that we uh, will have the recording up uh, on the YouTube and also the slides will become available as well on our website. Um, so just wanted to thank you all again, uh, you know, before if you decide to jet out of here, but uh, feel free to uh, put some more things in chat. Uh, but this is well, this is a last uh, presentation for the day uh, and we will continue uh, tomorrow because I have to look up my time conversions here all the time. Uh, 1230. Yes, 1230 um, will be the start for Eastern. And I believe that's uh, 930 Pacific. 930 AM at most. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> time zones. We can do it. I know. Yeah. She, she's always uh, keeping me in check with the time zones. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for, for being here. And uh, Jennifer, Angela, and Elizabeth, thanks for presenting with me. Um, and thanks also to Laura Berry from Equinox, who was the, the one who helped me get the idea in the first place. So I appreciate that inspiration. Um, so I hope everyone has a fantastic rest of your day and we will see you all tomorrow.